Um, Jeanette Sade Khan is the commissioner, been the commissioner uh, of the New York City Department of Transportation since 2007. Uh, was born in San Francisco and received an undergraduate degree from Occidental College and a law degree from Columbia. Directly to her left, Gabe Klein. He is now the commissioner of the Chicago Department of Transportation. Before that, most recently, he was the director of the Department of Transportation in Washington, uh, D.C., uh, where we got to know him. And then to his left, Pam O'Connor is the mayor, first uh, elected to the Santa Monica City Council in 1994 and is currently in her fourth term as mayor, has also served on the L.A. County Metro Board since 2001. Let, let me start for all of you. Uh, thank you all, first of all, for joining us. Let me start with a broad question. I think it's fair to say that through the 20th century in most cities, and certainly at the federal level, the transportation model was centered primarily on the car. And the highest priority was making vehicular traffic move more smoothly. Is that still the model? And if not, what has replaced it? Uh, the, I don't think that is the model anymore. And uh, as Ed Schuyler aptly pointed out, uh, for the first time in history, most of the population lives in cities. Um, and the way that we're going to accommodate the growth, you know, 6.3 billion in the next 40 years, uh, is by making our cities work more efficiently, especially with regard to transportation. And we're not going to do that by triple decking our roads. Um, we have, we work and live in a global marketplace where companies and, and people can move anywhere. And so we're really competing for the best talent and the best companies. And to do that, we have to have a high quality of life and have efficient mobility. You know, the last big design idea that we had uh, in transportation was really in the 1950s. Um, and the goal was really to move cars as fast as possible from point A to point B. And I think what was missing in that, although it was, you know, effective at the time, was the notion that uh, streets are some of our most valuable real estate. You know, we can't mm -hmm. afford to have them be in suspended animation for 50 years and continue to grow and thrive. So bringing some balance back to the table, making it more efficient for people to get around by bikes and by buses, creating room for people to enjoy a city, to making our streets as safe as possible, is not just good for sustainability and livability and quality of life, that's true, but it's also key for the economic development uh, of cities in the 21st century. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I agree with everything Jeanette said, of course. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think it was interesting sitting in on some of the panels earlier, like on technology, we're just, we're in a, a state of flux and a state of change. And from now on, it's always going to be that way. <clears throat> and I think for many years, you know, cities played to their strengths in the first half of the last century, and then they really lost a sense of themselves, and people went to the suburbs. And there's a natural sort of swing back. I think people have gotten um, more sensible. And um, the, you know, creative economy, the, the new economy is all about creating that friction that happens in cities. And listening to Jeanette talk and looking at her work in New York, there's so much about public <coughs> space and reinventing public space for people. And, um, you know, people now, their phone is their remote control for life, and they're, they're working in the plazas, you know. They're uh, not only conducting <laughs> business, you know, they're living very densely, um, and they are uh, uh, spending their free time. Like, I'm looking here at, at, at Battery uh, Park and this whole area. It's amazing what they've done. And so cities are, once again, cities, and people want to live there because they want to be part of that energy uh, that's fostering new businesses and... Um, a different way of life, a different quality of life. It's not really about ownership of things. And it's more about experiencing the city and experiencing things. And I think at the end of the day, what the people up here are doing is just really giving people what they want. Um, and sometimes the government is way behind the public. And, you know, once in a blue moon, people aren't maybe as far behind. And uh, I think that's a, that's a great thing for cities. Well, well, Mayor, if we think of any place that is synonymous with the car, it is Southern California. Yes, I come from the land of freeways. So how many Californians in the room? All right, we have some. Yeah. yeah. So, but actually, the freeways in California originally were l rail lines. They were put there, many of them built by developers, because they had to have a way for people to go to the residential suburbs that were being built and get to their jobs. And then mid-20th century, it was replaced by the freeways. Well, now we're going through another renaissance in Southern California where we're saying, 
free ways. As you say, we're not going to triple deck them. So how do we get around? How do we move around? Now, something interesting about California, though, we have an Environmental Quality Act called the California Environmental Quality Act, and this is where it gets a little perverse. The way that has been, it's adopted in 1970, but over the decades in the 60s, 70s, and so, the concept was level of service of cars, getting the cars through the intersections. How do you mitigate that? You mitigate that by widening, by, by making, you know, making sure that the cars can flow and that can make it difficult for pedestrians to walk. So now we need to change that. We're working on change that. That level of service that we see in many of our areas needs to be the throughput of people, people on transit. And we're, it's a, actually a very exciting time in Southern California because in Los Angeles County, we have a half cent sales tax that was passed by the voters and it needed two thirds of the voters to pass that. And that now has given us the funding to build more transit. We are building a network of rail and we're borrowing ideas. We'll talk more about those Ooh, from you, um, right. biking, walking. So it, we're transforming the Los Angeles region and it's becoming different. And while it's a land of freeways and, and cars will always be an important part, there will be roads, but we are handling our roads differently. And as we know, Southern California is the only place where the, the freeways get the the in yeah, front of them. It gives you a sense of how important they are, like the 105 and right. the 110. Um, but you, you know, you talked about balance, right? You mm -hmm. talked about balance. So do, what, when you're talking about the big, dense cities like New York, when you, when you use the word balance, does that imply that the goal of public policy should be to discourage the car from the central city? Is that part of the goal? I think what we're talking about is balance and choice and br bringing choice to the city. That's what people want, you know? Nobody's saying, I agree. It's not that the car is going away. It's just that we need to bring some more balance back to the table so that people have some other options. You know, New Yorkers like to get around in a New York minute, you know? They want to get mm -hmm. around. And they want to have different opportunities to get around different ways. So, you know, a third of New Yorkers get around by walking and a third of New Yorkers get around by transit, and a third of New Yorkers get around by driving. And so for the two-thirds of New Yorkers that don't drive, you know, what we're trying to do is bring back some of those planning disciplines, those uh, uh, modes that traditional traffic engineering had put to the side. And so I really do think that, and, and what has happened, you know, we've put in almost 400 miles of on-street bike lanes, built 57 miles of new dedicated bus lanes, launched uh, the largest bike share system in North America, thanks to City, um, And all of that is about choice. And the interesting piece is, and this was talked about before, the people are ahead, I think, of the politicians and the press. So now you see 64% of New Yorkers like bike mm -hmm. lanes, and 72% of New Yorkers like the plazas, and 73% like bike share. And so, Really, it's, a, it's, it's embraced and it's understood and people, I think, have come to expect it. Whereas I think in the past, because there was this sense of our streets were in suspended animation and they could never be changed and they were just this fixed asset for all of time, you know, it was never going to change, um, that they'd almost given up, right? We were on our fourth groundbreaking of the Second Avenue subway, right? So that's not exactly mm. the mark of a mm -hmm. with it city. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think what we've done is shown that in fairly short order, you can actually change a city in real time. Let's come and back. you can bring I'll, that choice I'll back. I want to come back in just a minute to that evolution of attitudes. But Gabe, everything that you know, you were talking about does imply or involve some taking back of space, right? That had previously been allocated to traffic and, and using it for other purpose. Are you going through? an experience or an exercise like that in Chicago at this point? Yeah, and just to add on to, to what Jeanette said, I mean, it was a default. It just got given to the cars. When the streetcars were torn out and various other bad choices were made and people fled the city, they became these, you know, their eight-lane, one-way pairs throughout cities to get people in and out as fast as possible, right? And uh, that's not what people want anymore. And when you do that, you... Uh, de facto create a public policy where you're telling people to get in their cars and drive because that's how you've designed mm -hmm. your city or redesigned it. And so I think what we're doing is trying to inject um, uh, a little bit of sense back into it and say, well, if a third of the people are walking and biking and a third of the people are taking transit and th a third of the, peop the people are driving, you know, what do we want to give people? And also, what do we want them to do? What's the most healthy thing that they can be doing? Is it driving... You know, I mean, a, a huge majority of trips in cities are less than two miles and people take their car. Mm -hmm. And so if we can um, uh, change that, and I think there's carrot and stick, right? And I think you can use a lot of carrot by giving people great options like bike share, which is fun, 
easy. It's 20 cents a day in Chicago to use bike share if, if you have a yearly membership. So there's a bit of social justice to it as well. And so we are giving space back to people um, versus just cars. And when you look at our BRT system downtown, we noticed that 4% um, of the traffic was buses, but 47% of the people going through the downtown were on buses. Wow. So it wasn't really equitable to just give all the space to cars. And if you want people to bike and you want people to walk, then give them bike lanes and wide sidewalks. And, and Pam, in your experience? Uh, in terms of it, this is what you were describing before, shifting from you know an environmental vision where the primary goal, the right. prime directive was R right. How, ease traffic how you were flow. implementing how that do you yeah how do you what, what is involved in creating more room for some of these other options? And they're saying the, the challenge was that cr that environmental had led to that level of service of cars. Now we're shifting to say it's the throughput of people. But another thing that's important and evolving is pricing. And it, it, they aren't just freeways anymore in Southern California. We now have started what we call an express lanes program. Those. We've had some lanes on our highways, as I will now call them, uh, that were high occupancy vehicle carpool lanes. We now have a pilot project in place in Los Angeles County where the one that a carpool lane is now priced. If, if you're a, you have to get a transponder, you can still ride in it mm. if you're a carpool of two or three people. I can't remember what that number is. But if you're a solo driver, you can choose to drive in it. You will pay a price to drive in it. We will guarantee 45 miles an hour in that lane. And also have, and the money that comes through gets reinvested into what we already have is more bus service along that goes in that lane. So people will be seeing the buses going through at 45 miles an hour when they're in the general purpose lanes. Now, right, a little slower. So we're in the pilot program stage, but right now we're pretty sure this is going to be successful, and we're in the looking at putting that in on more of our highways. Again, you know, take, and that's a big thing, taking away a lane from the car, in right. effect, and pricing it, and also pricing parking. Yeah, so Jeanette, you, you, you noted the, the, the poll numbers now on many of the initiatives, but that isn't necessarily where they all started. I mean, there was, there was a certain amount of controversy around almost, I think, all of the major uh, uh, things, uh, projects you've undertaken. I'm wondering, you know, we've got an audience here of transportation professionals. What does it take, what, 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 is, what, do you, what have you taken from your experience about what it takes to sustain and build public support for changes that do involve some disruption in the way things have traditionally been done? What was involved in kind of getting to the point where they are broadly accepted? Well, I think the very first thing you have to do is have a plan. Um, and Mayor Bloomberg in 2007 released Plan YC, uh, visionary long-term uh, sustainability and infrastructure investment plan. And it basically said, you know, if we're going to continue to grow and thrive and accommodate a million more people in New York City by 2030, there's some things that we have to do differently. And there was uh, a lot of outreach in developing that plan, and people came to understand that if we you know, wanted to live in a city where we opened the door in 2030 and we liked what we saw, that meant we needed to do some things differently. And it had some fundamental implications for how we use our streets. And that we needed to have a plan for them, not just let you know, them happen. Right? We haven't updated them to meet the demands that businesses have on them, that communities have on them, you know, parking, none of that had been updated in some 50 years. And so what we did was took a, 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 an approach that said, we're going to take a look at this valuable asset differently. And so we came up with a strategic plan that had a lot of goals, you know, benchmarks, and then told the public what it was that we were going to do and held ourselves accountable to it. I think that's the first piece that was important. The second piece is that we moved very quickly right. to show that there, the plan was called a greater, greener New York. And I think that there had been some skepticism about whether anything greater or greener was going to happen in our lifetimes. Um, and what we proved, and what the mayor's uh, administration proved, was that that is absolutely possible. And so we, I think the biggest innovation we did was show that it's possible to change a space, the use of a space in real time. You can you know, transform a parking lot overnight. Literally overnight sometimes. Literally right? overnight. Right. And so that made a big difference. And it's, people started to see it and then pointed to things. I want that. I want that. I want that. And then the final piece that I think made a big difference in addition to the polls was that we measured what we did. And so, you know, I work for a data-driven mayor, um, if you didn't know that. <laughs> uh, and so uh, we, because we worked quickly, we were able um, to measure the effect of these projects three years after implementation. So we were able to show that with the first protected bike lane in the United States of America, 
you know, retail sales went up 50% on the Ninth Avenue corridor. We were able to show in that first uh, underutilized parking lot that we transformed that in Dumbo, retail sales went up 173%. You know, three times that of other adjacent areas in the neighborhood. We were able to document the economic development benefits and the safety benefits and the usage. And that went a long way, I think, also to building support for the program. We do go door to door with all of our projects. And so we, every single person is talked yeah. to. There's kind of this, you know, feel this, this, it's written about that we just kind of go in there like the Wizard of Oz and just do whatever we want. But it's not actually like that. Um, we do go door to door, and there's a lot of outreach, and I think that it, it actually has has paid off. What's the toughest, Gabe? Uh, either DC or Chicago, uh, the Ooh. changes that you that you pursue, which has been the most difficult? I mean, I and guess why? Chicago. Um, well, DC, just because everything is difficult in Chicago. Well, DC was personally a little tough for me because I came from the private sector, about 16 years in the private sector. I didn't even know what FHWA stood for, um, so. Uh, as I was talking to Harriet about, I think last night, you know, one of the best things was that I didn't know anything about government, so I, I wasn't sort of prejudiced. Well, I was prejudiced against government, but I didn't know what couldn't be done. And so, um, you know, to to Jeanette's point, I think putting together those plans was hugely important. I did that in uh, D.C. based actually on, on on what Jeanette had done in New York and followed that model. In Chicago, we put out six different plans. Um, our big plan, which is an update's coming out next week, but then a pedestrian plan and a, a 2020 cycling plan and a complete streets uh, plan or, or design guidelines, and then a last week sustainable urban I infrastructure guidelines. Now, we put it out to the public because we do want to build credibility. The reality is nobody's going to read them in the public mm -hmm. except for, you know, maybe people in this room, and they might not even read it. But it's important to have goals, you know, psychologically to have goals, to have it down in paper, to report on what you uh, uh, accomplished. And at the end of the day, you know, I always tell our team that the topic is transportation, but um, our real business is change management. And that's what we do. And um, I think what you have seen now is that people can do things really quickly um, if they're focused, you know, we, we put in our first uh, protected bike lane in Chicago within 30 days of the mayor taking office. Um, because, and, and Jeanette and I were talking about this outside, like 10% of people, I think, can sort of get a vision or have a vision for the future and what it's going to be. And about 90% of people really need to see it to know what it is and do they want more of it. And I think that's what you're starting to see in cities. And people are seeing it and saying, yeah, that's great. Um, there was an article in the Tribune before Divi Bike Share launched. And this uh, quote-unquote expert, he was a lawyer who rode a bike, uh, was asked to comment on Divi, and he said, it's going to be a disaster, it's, you know, it's going to be a huge problem, it's going to fail. I screamed at the reporter. A anyway, then um, about two months later, uh, th this gentleman wrote a follow-up article, quoted the same guy who had since become a yearly member and said he's come to rely on it, and he said, I was totally wrong. And that was like the best thing that I could hear about bike share. What's been the toughest in terms of changing the hegemony of the car and Santa Monica. Mm, yeah, I, I don't know what's been the toughest, but I think what's making it happen are the millennial generation mm -hmm. coming in and that converging with smartphone technology. I mean, just in Los Angeles County, we have legacy uh, providers of transit. We have 16 different municipal operators. So think about it. 15 years ago, if you wanted to transfer, say, from a Santa Monica bus to Culver City or Long Beach, which is about 20 miles away, you'd have to, how would you get your hands on that schedule? You know, how would you find it? Well, now with smartphone technology, we you can connect those trips together. So, uh, and you know, for whatever reasons, whether it's the Great Recession, whether it's people wanting to live more frugally or having to live more frugally, whether people, the people who want to live in those exciting nodes, such as Santa Monica, downtown Los Angeles, mm -hmm. we have many more in Los Angeles County, all of those are leading to folks saying we want to live a different way. And you know, you're not well, using the well, car. Let me ask you, I mean, if you think about th many of the things that have been the most exciting that are happening in transportation in cities, like the, car, uh, like the bike share, the bike lanes, the car share, the more open space, is this applicable? Can this be retrofit only onto cities with a given, with, with an existing level of density, essentially our East Coast cities and a few on, you know, San Francisco and Seattle and Portland? Can you take this same model and apply it to Sunbelt cities that are basically, that were basically built around the car and defined by sprawl? Absolutely. And um, actually, uh, Gabe and I are part of an organization called the National Association of City Transportation Officials. So it's the largest 15 cities in the United States and then affiliates um, that are smaller. And basically, what we found is that a lot of the design guidance for cities is also 
very old and outdated, almost like back to the days of the prairie, you know. Um, and it's certainly not a adapted to meet the needs of metropolitan areas, however big or small. And so the design considerations for cities are very different from the design consideration from a freeway that's taking you across the country. So you need to design differently. But we had waited for a long time to try to get our um, uh, strategies through and it didn't work. And so we took it upon ourselves to write a new playbook for New York C for uh, 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 US uh, streets. And so we released this two weeks ago at Brookings, and, and it's available online, um, the um, Street Design Guide. Um, I'll give you mm. the, the address at the end of the talk. You just look it up under NACTO. But what it is, is it, it really is a new, it, it is the way to create and build 21st century streets, no matter how big or small give, you give are. Me the, give, me, give me the short version of, I, mean, I don't know if we've had the mayor of Phoenix is here, or I don't know if he's, in, in the, with, he's here, or Houston. I mean, how do you take the kind of the insights that you're pursuing in a dense place uh, where there is a lot of tradition of public transportation mm -hmm. uh, and, and apply it to places where essentially almost, you know, the vast, vast majority of both business and personal trips are now taken by car. Well, you're trying to build in additional mobility on top of that existing asset, right? And so you're trying to make it easier for people to get around, more affordable for people to get around, uh, more sustainable for people to get around. So that is about prioritizing in transit, right? Transit is a really important component of the development and the future economic performance of cities. So it doesn't have to be a subway, it can be a bus rapid transit mm. line. And how do you adapt your existing infrastructure to be able to accommodate that? How do you do that? A lot of times there's been no playbook, there's no US design guidance you can look to to how you get that done. This is that way to actually provide that kind of guidance. And I think the other important piece is that you know there's a big network of sharing what works and what doesn't. And I love the fact that now you're starting to see this huge global competition about who can be the greenest, who can be the most sustainable. I think that's a great uh, competition to have. And what you're also seeing is that cities are actually uh, replicating this. I mean, when we put down, you know, the, the uh, after we painted Times Square, you saw that replicated all over. You know, LA looked at the plazas, Buenos Aires, you know, just downloaded the DOT website, turned it into their sustainable streets plan, and then started painting their streets. And so in an age of social media where people can take Instagram, Flickr pictures, everything, they, it moves fast. It's not like it used to. And so people can point to it and say, I want that. So Mayor, okay, I'll come back to you. So Mayor, I'm taking this to LA, which is certainly one of those places that were not designed, you know, originally designed around the car and, and just have just enormous uh, sprawl. Um, you're talking about light rail, connecting Santa Monica to downtown. Um, I used to live in Los Angeles, and there's always been a lot of interest in transit. How big a dent can you make with light rail, or are the endpoints that people have to get to ultimately too scattered from the, just the existing geography of the city to really take a bite out of the reliance on the car? Well, in Southern California, our metropolitan planning organization is at six counties, 194 cities, and we put together our regional transportation plan. And this time, because of state mandates saying that you need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions tied to uh, vehicle use, you have to integrate transportation with land use as you're doing your planning for your regional transportation plan. You also have to put together something called a sustainable community strategy. Well, we were successful in our region in putting that together, getting 84 elected officials on our regional council to vote for it. And it's a plan that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions, has uh, targets. And in doing that, the, all the work, all the underpinning, all the research, all the planning for that, we've identified in the six county area that there are many areas that what we call high quality transit areas. We've built a network in LA County alone in the last 20 years. If you look at a map of LA County 22 years ago, you see not a single rail. Now you will see commuter rail, you will see some subway, you will see light rail, the light rail network is growing. In addition, we have rapid bus. We have rapid bus on the streets, and the other counties have various programs too, including commuter rail. So looking at that, there are an incredible number of places that you're within a quarter mile, half mile of that transit. So we're now working, and a specific project in LA County is our county working together with our MPO, SCAG, Southern California Association of Governments, to, uh, to say that is that first mile, last mile issues that we have. You know, whether it's biking, walking, what are the ways that we can, whether it's a shuttle, what are the ways that we can help learn to make, to connect the people in that half mile, that quarter mile to transit, because there is a lot of potential and opportunity in Southern California, and we have good weather most of the year. So again, in terms of thinking about transit, which is bike share, 
love bike share, but in terms of moving large numbers of people, transit is still. Uh, I've seen the stats that two thirds of all the public transit commuting that occurs in the U.S. occurs in six cities, you know, um, and which which begin with this level of density and this kind of tradition of you know just kind of a, uh, a, a almost a cultural acceptance of this mode of transportation. So is this? I mean, do you see this making? A, can you take this these ideas and bring them to the places that are that are almost completely outside of the network? There is very little kind of any kind of communal transportation. Yeah, I mean, you know, those six cities have mass transit systems. So they have subways or elevated lines and big bus networks. We carry um, about 800,000 people on the CTA rail every day and, and a million on buses. Um, and, you know, we used to, as I said before, we used to have streetcar systems. And then there's this argument about streetcar versus BRT and, you know, what should um, primary cities, secondary cities sort of look at depending on their size. and you know, I, I think, you, first of all, you shouldn't count out bike share as mass transit because, like, we just hit 10,000 trips a day. I think you just hit 30,000 trips a day or something. 42,000. 42, so, like, we have one uh, L line that's reaching capacity. It, it's 100,000, our brown line is 100,000 trips away during peak uh, of being at capacity. I think we'll get to 50,000 trips by next summer on, on Divi. So I think it can have a real effect. And the fact is not everybody can afford to put in new rail lines. I mean, we started building a streetcar line, two streetcar lines in DC. And I can tell you, it's painful. I mean, it's really hard work uh, from a change management standpoint, but also the infrastructure that you need. And I was thinking about this just the other day uh, as I was walking around looking at, at City Bike. In many ways, it's not BRT versus streetcar. I mean, really, the bike share system has almost taken the place of streetcar. Uh, which used to very slowly move people around the city above ground. Um, but it's a much cheaper way to do it. You know, streetcars are three million a pop, three and a half million mm. a pop. Uh, we put the entire capital bike share system in for six million. Yeah. So there are high return, lower cost investments you can make in some of these uh, maybe smaller cities and towns as well. So let me ask you, I'm thinking about you know, when I, again, I think of many, of, and probably incorrectly, many of these innovations, you think about the center city, think about Manhattan in this case. You've got, you know, you've got the other boroughs. I grew up in Queens. Um, and there was an interesting Brookings study last year that kind of raised the issue of the mismatch between where people live and where the jobs are, particularly for people in middle income and below. I mean, the, the question of the accessibility of employment and whether public transportation can get you there. Th their study was that only 30%, most metro area residents can only get to about 30% of jobs within 90 minutes using public transit. Um, uh, and that kind of raising the question of whether it is a plausible, feasible, to create a public transportation system dense enough to get them to employment, or whether we have to have find other means like car sharing. What, what's your thinking on that? Well, I think that uh, you know the mayor, Mayor Bloomberg, has had a, a very strong five borough strategy. It is not just about mm -hmm. the Manhattan Central Business District. Um, and we've also, all of the uh, select bus service lines, you know, the first one we started on Fordham Road in the Bronx, you know, the, we did Staten Island, mm -hmm. you know, we've got uh, Brooklyn's Nostrand Avenue coming next. You know, the idea is to try to tie these areas together, make it easy for people to get around quickly and conveniently. You know, you're not going to wish people onto a bus. Right? You have to create a high capacity, attractive choice. And so I think what you're seeing now is a big demand for that. The select bus service, the uh, BRT that Gabe is building in Chicago, it's a, it's a higher level of bus. And so if you create that kind, if you provide that kind of service, people are going to use it because they want to get around quickly and conveniently. So I think that's a really interesting mm -hmm. way in the future to knit together these different areas. And you're starting to see strategic plans. We've got a 10-year BRT plan that builds out all of those connected corridors. And that's, it's going to be a much less expensive venture than it would be to do that with any kind of rail. And it's going to be a lot faster. But I think to the point about, you know, are you going to get communities to want to transit? If you take a look at the New Starts pipeline right now, that's basically the federal funding that people are looking for to build transit projects across the United States. It is subscribed to the year 2080. So there is a huge demand. It's not that people don't want it. It's, it's about finding ways to finance it and deliver it in a cost-effective, 
and, uh, and uh, time sensitive way. And I think Gabe is absolutely right that, get, that bike share is a, a key piece of this. You know, four months into bike share, we have 42,000 people a day on this system, right? Four months. And do you, do you have any sense, by the way, how that divides between people commuting, tourists, any sense of who's using it? Uh, well, that's, it's about 50-50. Um, but uh, we've already got 87,000 annual members, and we have something like three, over 300,000 daily and weekly members. Mm. So, you know, if you build it, they will come. Um, and, and so I think that that's a one part of the, of the program going forward. We are moving toward a shared economy. You know, you are look, yeah. people are looking, you know, uh, when you look at motor vehicle registrations, yep. you know, among younger generations, they, they don't want to have the hassle, the cost, uh, of, of owning a car and so providing ways for people to get around without having to do that it's not to say that the car is going to go away and there are areas in Queens mm -hmm. you know where you have to have a car to get there but you have to build in other ways uh, at particularly as you're growing you mentioned a word that we had not incredibly mentioned in the first uh, half hour here and which has not come up that much all day and that's federal um, uh, now, assuming that the federal government does reopen at some point in our lifetime, <laughs> right? Uh, assuming, assuming that, that it is not permanently closed, uh, I'm just wondering how federal policy fits into the calculation for all of you in terms of what you can and can't do. How important is it and how it, could it be more helpful than it is today? Interestingly enough, I mean, I don't want the federal government to step back from what responsibility it may have or contribution it can make because we are looking uh, for federal for matching grants for full funding grant agreements for a subway extension in Los Angeles County as well as a regional connector which would connect our light rail lines that come in from the south uh, into Los, the city of LA downtown and go out in the north to connect those by light rail. But and that's important funding and what the state gives us. But when we looked at our regional transportation plan, frankly, 70% of the funding that from transit goes from local, is generated at local sources in Southern California. So we are looking to ourselves to build our own. We then have a strong obligation, because I noted earlier, voters said another half cent sales tax, so we need to, we need to get that built, we need to perform uh, and, and operate it, but right now, we are the ones, uh, we're, we're doing the heavy lifting. Uh, we need the partners at federal and state level, but but if we waited for them, we would not be building the network. Gabe, you've got a mayor with a few friends in Washington. What, where, where does yeah. Washington fit in? Um, well, or at least know, acquaintances. Yeah, and friends acquaintances. is too strong. <laughs> I'm not touching that. Um, so I started in D.C. right after Obama came into office, and I thought it would be a very exciting time to work in uh, government and in transportation, and it has been. And I would say that at the federal level, they've been extremely supportive uh, partners. Um, but there's a lot of you know career service people that just – don't want to see things change. And I think that um, at the city level, that's obviously where the innovation is happening. And I, I know for us, you know, we've had to just push and push and sometimes just do things over their objections because the public wants it. And the mayors are responsible directly to their constituents more than any other politician. And so um, we've been able to get enough done that people are saying, no, we do want that. And the, the uh, NACTO uh, bike, uh, bikeway design guidelines were huge. Secretary LaHood came out and endorsed them. Uh, that didn't even change everybody's minds at Federal Highways. Now the urban uh, design uh, guidelines are out there. And so we're saying, like, you can't put a square peg in a round hole. There's nothing wrong necessarily with the suburbs. There's nothing wrong with rural America. But the city is different. And so I think we'd like to see the same financial support or more. But I think the reality is we're not going to get it. And the TIFI loan program, which expanded by a factor of 10, has been a real boon for Chicago in terms of building our new river walk um, and so on. And I think that if we're going to get less money from them, and uh, then we need more control over the outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Role of yeah. Washington? Um, I think that uh, you know the last big vision that the Department of Transportation really kind of had was um, building the interstate system. Check. We have built the interstate system. Um, and I think what we really do need is a bigger vision about uh, what, can, wh what this uh, country needs to do uh, in terms of investing in, in its infrastructure. And you know, we're, what, at 1.5%, 2% GDP on our infrastructure spend. China is at 7 8% GDP spend. I mean, we are way far behind. We are going to be effective competitors in the 21st century. We really need to up our game in that regard. And so what's happening is mayors like Mayor Bloomberg, uh, they, they are 
leading the way, um, whether it is working with the private sector to have a privately funded bike share system, 100% taxpayer free uh, system, you know, brought a new different form of financing to the table, or it's the extension of the seven line, uh, the subway extension done through a TIF and uh, different methods of financing things. We're gonna have to find creative ways to finance uh, our future, but I think as Gabe said, you know, it's going to be very important that we have the wherewithal to be able to get that done uh, with no strings attached because it has become, it is difficult to get through the approval process. Even things like metropolitan planning organizations, which the mayor's talked about, I mean, these are entities that are, you know, very old. And if you thought about, you know, uh, no other country would ever set it up so that you had to go through this approval process to get things done. So it's just really not 21st century government structure. Um, uh, and so I think that's an area that needs some additional reform. I want to bring in the audience in a minute, but Gabe, I want to and maybe the mayor to follow up on something that Jeanette said before. When you talked about, you said there is a shift going on in terms of the desirability, the, 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 uh, the determination to own vehicles on, on younger people. And th this is a big debate about whether we are seeing kind of a generational shift or kind of a recession effect, right? I mean, there's, there's no question uh, the uh, Energy Information Energy Information Administration says the amount of miles driven in 2012 was 10% lower than they had forecast as recently as 2006. But obviously, mm -hmm. that over, overlaps with the downturn. Do you believe we are seeing something fundamental and that there will be less, there's less desire to own car, use car, rely on car? Uh, or is this fundamentally recession driven? Um, uh, it's a generational shift. It, it's a change. Oh, sorry. Uh, it is a shift. Um, Mayor Bloomberg was saying uh, this morning that by 2050, you know, two thirds uh, of people will live in cities. They're not going to all own cars. It's going to be very expensive to live in the city. When you decouple the cost of housing and transportation, you realize, oh, I can't afford to live in the city. Um, if I use bike share and transit, Primarily, you know, I'm going to spend $100 a month uh, versus $1,200 a month with a car in New York or, or D.C. And I, you know, cut my teeth uh, 10, 12 years ago at, at Zipcar, and we were sort of ahead of the curve a, a little bit, but we saw that people are coming back to cities, and um, uh, we worked with the government, put car-sharing vehicles on the street so people felt that it was an extension of public transportation. Um, and, you know, Harriet and I have talked about this. The... The population's exploding in Washington. It's growing by over a thousand a month, which for a city that size is great, and uh, uh, continues to see a drop in uh, vehicle re registrations and vehicle miles traveled. So, um, it it really it's it's not possible for people to keep driving at the same rate with the population growing. Santa Monica. I think it's Southern California. I, I think it's generational. You do. also, but but in Southern California, maybe there are going to be a lot of households that still have a car, but. If you have one car, that's not as bad as having two or three cars. So I mean, we have high, no, we, we, in the state of California, we have an incredible number of vehicles registered. Mm -hmm. And if the household doesn't need the second car or the third car, hey, that's a savings to that household, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of where they're living. They can get around. They may still have that one car. So it, it's, a, it's a shift, um, but I think it is driven by the generation comes yeah. coming up. Interesting. And in California, that could be three cars for a household of two people. Right? Seriously. Right. Yes, yes right. that, that is um, All right. Uh, let's, uh, let's go to some questions in the audience. Uh, we got one in the back and then one over here. Please identify yourself also. Um, what in your view, two of you represent cities that really have no control, direct control over your regional transit provider. Chicago is really the only one of the three where CTA is effectively uh, uh, an instrument of the mayor's intentions uh, sooner or later. Tell me a bit about the ideal relationship between a city government and a transit agency that's geographically bigger than you are. And how do you get that transit agency in line with what you're trying to do as a city. Are, are there any reporters in here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> at, least one, at least one that I'm aware of, yes. I mean, I, I can start on that one and, and just say that, um, yeah, the airport, uh, the transit authority and myself all report directly to the mayor. There's a board for CTA, but for all intents and purposes, uh, Forrest Claypool reports to the mayor and it's very helpful. Um, the mayor is extremely forward thinking on transit, public space, in, in innovation. Um, and uh, he actually directly gets involved in 
the, the, the design of transit stations and so on. And Forrest and I are sort of married at the hip. So for instance, on bus rapid transit, uh, I'm leading, our agency's leading the project downtown and his agency is leading the Ashland <coughs> uh, project, which is about a 16 mile stretch north south. But it doesn't really matter because we're working on it together. Either he's leading or I'm leading. It really depends on who's going for what funding. Um, and, uh, but I, I think you know, what Ed Reskin has in San Francisco, it's not all transit, um, uh, but it's great, you know, where he's got taxis and parking. I mean, I think the more control you can have, mm -hmm. it's better because you can affect more change. Yeah, no, obviously it's great when it's kumbaya, you know, and everybody all agrees on the on the strategy. Um, and you're waiting for that day. And, and I've been singing it for a long time, um, uh, probably off key, but trying anyway. I think that this 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 mayor of in our under the Bloomberg administration has worked very collaboratively with the MTA uh, in particular, and uh, you know I think everybody understands that the future of the city of New York is tied to the strength of its transit system, right? I mean, even a subway ride is, you know, is, you know, what's the price of a slice of pizza, right? It's like just integral to our daily life. Um, so I think that there's a detailed understanding that uh, transit investment is, an, is a key part of our future success. That's why the mayor pushed so hard for congestion pricing, um, which would have brought you know, a dedicated revenue stream to the MTA to fund major capital investments that we absolutely need to continue to grow and thrive. Um, you know, I did, it didn't happen for a variety of uh, reasons, but I do think that it's a matter of uh, when and not a matter of if. Um, and I do think that there's, a, is a, that there's an understanding among the major stakeholders uh, around the city and the region that that's a very important piece to do. Uh, and so again, I think there's a shared understanding. You know, there are little spitball fights every now and then. Um, but I agree with Gabe. It's much better if you can have more control. You know, four out of 12 appointments is not, you know, ideal. But but that said, I think that the city has been very effective at making its case on the regional the way, transit right, side. Right, right. By the way, thank you, New York, for rejecting that yeah. money because that gave us our express lane. Right here. Right here. Thank you. <laughs> I want to get back. All to politics is local. Yes. Yeah. I want to get back to a question that Ron asked, and and just ask it a little differently. If you were, uh, if you were writing the plan for, let's say Dade County for transportation, and you know generally or any equally sprawling uh, county in the in the country, what are the first three things that your plan would say would advise them to do? I used to live in Broward. Uh, okay, that counts. And I know Dade fairly well. I mean, it seems like there's a big land use problem. Like, I, I was down there a year ago, and I was using a deco bike, and, you know, it's great on South Beach. But the reality is um, everything is so sprawling, and, you know, everything's one level or two. Um, I don't know how you overcome some of that. Um, I mean, you can reconfigure your roadways, and you can put in bike share and things of that nature. But I think you need a change in the level of density. So that's the first thing that I would do, and then um, I would look at you know, bus rapid transit or a light rail line or something like that that linked the tourist areas to the mainland and to the um, airports and things of that nature, um, and then expand the bike share wh while you're changing the way the street makeup and uh, design is, but that's just off the top of my head. I would just say transit, transit, transit. Um, and the transit land use connection. And there's a lot of value capture that's there. There's a lot of opportunity there on the financing, how to make it happen. But it really is, that's, that's the prime directive. The gentleman to the right, the glasses was there first, but you can, if you, both, if you talk quick, we can get you both in. I'll talk quickly. <clears throat> the way we finance um, streets and road improvements through the gas tax seems a little archaic. Technology seems like an option, a VMT transponder kind of thing. Did I just use the term, it's not if, it's when, uh, comment. Comment? Comment. Going from gas uh, tax to what, oh, measuring okay. miles and charging you by that Well, way? you know, that's a, it, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I mean, with uh, the increased fuel efficiency of cars, um, we are going to have to look at a different model. In New York City, under Mayor Bloomberg, what we're doing is we actually got a, a funding for a, a pilot out of FHWA where we're going to have uh, black boxes installed in uh, fleets of cars and trucks to measure the distance so that we 
uh, are able to capture a different way of measuring uh, the impact on our roads. It has to be vehicle miles traveled, not the amount of uh, gas you're using. And so that's going to be a way, if we can find out different ways to incentivize consumers to do that, maybe it's, and that's the applications that we're looking at right now, maybe it's competing against one another. I mean, am I a more, few, uh, you know, better driver than Gabe? You know, obviously I am. Probably. But uh, <laughs> I want to be able to prove it. <laughs> I work for a data-driven guy. So um, looking at the different applications for how we can get that done is very important. And it is, uh, several states are experimenting also in this arena. The state of Oregon is doing a lot in this regard. I think uh, LA, uh, I, I think California is looking at it too. And so we have to transition off of it, but we need to make sure that the technology is there. So that's what we're... Uh, in the process of doing while protecting the privacy, well, you know, of consumers. I was going to say, post Edward Snowden, post NSA, right. could you imagine there'd be a certain amount of resistance to the idea of federal, state, or local government being able to track exactly how far you're driving and, and you where you're driving? You think they don't do that now? Well, yeah, there you go. <laughs> right. Well, there's, maybe, maybe making it easier for them might have a certain... There is definitely resistance, but, you know, uh, you could do something else, too. Uh, Virginia, actually, is, you know, looking at a sales... Or they've, they've passed a sales tax. I think it's a half-cent sales tax. So you could do a combination of, of the cordon pricing that mm -hmm. you were working on and sales tax, so the more you consume, you probably you know, drive a bit more or you at least have more money to spend. And, and our regional transportation plan in Southern California, which was certified by the federal government, um, it has to have where you're going to, in the, over the 30 year period, get your money. And we are the first in the country to have set a vehicle miles VMT. Mm -hmm. oh. um, you get the last question, please identify yourself. Uh, I'm Brent Totter, and I'm an urbanism consultant now, but I'm the former chief planner for Vancouver, Canada. And one of uh, our favorite lines is the best transportation plan is a great land use plan. And um, that, a, a few mentions to that, but it's almost as a bit of a throwaway comment. Now, you've got two cities that enjoy the kind of land use uh, mix and densities and such that almost make it easy. And I know it's not easy, uh, but uh, almost make it easy to have a discussion about multimodal region building and city building. The vast majority of the cities in Canada, the United States, Australia, uh, are more suburban than urban. And the most of the growth is in the suburban areas. How, what, what do you have to say for the integration of land use and transportation beyond the comments you've made? Because right now we've got two professions that at best don't talk to each other and at worst often are in a sort of form of warfare. Yeah, I mean, I would just, to add on to what Jeanette said, which is a quick but very important comment, and that is you have to look at, at the, the value capture or the return on investment. Even for Carol's question, I think, about what to do in Miami, like what's going to generate the biggest return? And then you can get a public-private partnership going. You can actually maybe get something done, and it's going to be tied to the increased value of that land, right? If you actually did build, build a light rail system or, or a bus rapid transit system, what's the value? political support for the density in the first yeah. place, yeah. which is yeah. the first challenge. But you have to lay out a vision for what it is that you're going to do. Mm -hmm. And that's the very first piece you're going to do. You can't just do it or you know, start to do it on a project-by-project project basis. People are not going to get that. It doesn't work that way. You have to lay out a vision for where your city or, uh, is and where it's going to be and what the impact is of those kinds of uh, decisions and acting or not acting. And that's, I think, a way that you can actually get there from here. Well, we couldn't book Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs, but I think you would agree <laughs> that short of that, it would have been hard to get more insight about public space and transportation on one stage. So would you thank me and join in joining uh, thank you. this great panel? And on to the rest of the day.